Hi everybody, welcome back to English 116. This is for our class for Wednesday, the 17th. And as you know, Monday we didn't meet because it was Patriots Day. And I apologize for missing class last week. So what we are going to be doing is putting some closure onto A Raisin in the Sun, the last drama in our drama unit. And I also wanted to introduce the idea of poetry and also talk about paper number two. So if you can see in the notes below, in the first section, it talks about how you can access paper number two in the syllabus and other documents folder. And basically paper number two is very similar to paper number one. The difference is based on the text that you would be writing about. So in this instance, since we're in the drama section, you would either be writing about the text or the performance of Oedipus the King, a Midsummer Night's Dream, or Raisin in the Sun. And your options, just like in the first paper, would either be identifying one of those and talking about why it should be included in the canon using evidence from the text or from the film, or perhaps the opposite perspective, talking about why it should not be included in the canon using evidence and, and textual references from either the text itself or the film. Your other option would be to talk about contemporary relevance, and contemporary relevance is oftentimes an element associated with inclusion or exclusion from the canon, but that's not the only element that we use to determine if a work is canonical. So if you wanted to talk about contemporary relevance again, or lack of contemporary relevance, your options would be Oedipus the King, Midsummer Night's Dream, or Raisin in the Sun, whether it be the production, the film that we saw in class, or it be the text version that we discussed in class. And four to five pages, much like your first paper, a critical paper, so you don't need to be consulting outside resources. And at this point, what I, I should be able to do this weekend is to catch up with any papers that were, paper number one, any of those papers that were submitted past the date indicated on our syllabus. So by that point, everybody should have feedback in terms of their writing. And I'm also planning in the next week or so, catching up with the discussion forum questions. I've fallen a little bit behind, so that'll give you perhaps additional ideas for what you could do with the paper, because you also have the option of creating your own essay topic, just as long as you have that topic approved by me. And in terms of the second paper, that's going to be due towards the ending of the semester, so you probably wouldn't have time to rewrite it. But my hope is that after reviewing the first paper and my comments, because I take a good amount of time writing comments, that you basically have undergone the um, review of how to write a paper so that you can now duplicate that with paper number two or with other papers in your literature classes as semesters progress. So I urge you to read those comments carefully. And as you know, you all have the option of revising paper number one. I just ask that you take those comments into account and that certainly if you need further direction, you reach out to me. And that when you submit in your revision, you submit in the original with my commentary on it along with your revision so I can compare and contrast the two. And then you would get the higher of the two grades. And that would be due by the ending of the semester. Though certainly the earlier the better for everybody involved. So in terms of talking about a raisin in the sun, one of the ways we can approach this particular drama is by talking about the significance of names. And think about all of the character names that I've detailed, again, in the second section of our notes below such as Mama, and obviously Mama is the matriarch of the family and serves as a mother figure to all of the characters. But know that her first name is Lena because everyone in the family leans on her and they rely on her, not just for love, but for the practicalities of life, shelter, utilities, food, even tuition and hobbies, which is one of the things we'll talk about with Benita. And one of the things that I very much um, appreciate about this play is the level of complexity of the characters. And we see how Mama is definitely a good and caring person, but we also see some of her flaws, which makes her very realistic. 
She imposes her religious views, for instance, on Benitha. She can be viewed as domineering, um, certainly with some of the exchanges that she has with Ruth about the raising of Travis. And we'll see this with all of the characters that they have, or just about all of the characters, that they have good and bad qualities. They're much more realistic than the characters we've seen in the past because they are much more contemporary. So we can see the progression of drama just with the three dramas that we've read and viewed thus far. Think about the surname of the family, Younger. And we talked a little bit about this with Young Goodman Brown. Young and all of the positive associations with youth, um, energy and excitement and ambition and anticipation but also some of the negatives associated with youth as well, being a, a naive or short-sighted. And we can see that with the family and all of the members within the family. Walter Lee Jr. Note that he's a junior, and the idea behind that is that he has to live in his father's shadow. In fact, Mama even tells him that she's waiting for him to be the man his father was. But note his nickname, Prometheus. And Prometheus is from Greek mythology, and Prometheus stole fire from the gods, basically forbidden knowledge, and he was punished accordingly. And notice how Walter Lee, too, steals. He literally steals beneath us inheritance. Um, not that he intends to do so, but he gives it away, in effect, in a bad business deal. And he suffers the consequences for it. And Walter's hubris and excessive ambition and pride is definitely an element within this play. And Walter, much like Prometheus, is always wanting more. Um, he is hoping for a liquor store. And in some ways, that represents the American dream, the idea of owning a business, of being independent, of being respected, of being um, financially secure enough to educate his son. Um, that said, as Mama talks about the negatives associated with liquor stores that oftentimes prey on the most vulnerable in society. Then we've got Ruth Younger, and Ruth is a biblical name. If you know anything about the biblical Ruth, she is a long-suffering daughter-in-law, which is exactly what we see in the context of this play. We see how Ruth is torn between her husband, Walter, and her mother, Mama. And definitely gender is an element in this play in that the women are able to bond in a way because of sexism. However, we also know that the characters are able to bond over other issues as well. So it could be based on bloodlines. It could be based on marriage. It could be based on education. So there's, again, a level of complexity in this play. We see how when Ruth contemplates abortion, and keep in mind that abortion was illegal during this time. So this is something that not only contradicts her religious views, this is a very religious family, but also would, in effect, be breaking the law. That's how desperate she is. Um, that's how dire the family situation is. At one point, she even says that um, if, if she has to, she'll strap the baby on her back and clean all the kitchens in America. This is towards the ending of the play where Mama seems to have given up hope. Travis Younger. Note that Travis is not named Walter Lee Jr. The third. He has a unique name. The idea that he's going to break out of the restrictions or the, the boundaries associated with the Walter Youngers of his father and grandfather. Note that the version of the play that we saw, um, the dresser, you can very clearly see two photos, one of the grandfather and one of Travis. Generational conflict is very much an element within this particular play. And minor details, for instance, the very beginning of the play where Ruth asks Walter how he wants his eggs. He says not scrambled, and of course she scrambles his eggs. How's that for passive-aggressive? But it also illustrates the idea that Walter's mind is scrambled at this point. He's not thinking clearly. Um, so again, um, Lorraine Hansberry is a very conscious writer. And I just wanted to clarify that 
in the production that we saw and also read that all of the competition for the bathroom is because multiple families living on the same floor are sharing one bathroom. Basically, these were larger units that were divided up into smaller units so landlords could earn more money and they're all sharing the bathroom. So again, part of the American dream for this family, for the youngers, is just to have some level of privacy in their own bathroom. Um, we see how Travis does go off on his own. For instance, buying a gift for Mama, where he decides not to basically join the family to buy gardening tools, but instead he's going to go off on his own. Um, it's very indicative, I think, of Travis's character. Note that at the beginning, he's quite concerned with carrying groceries, um, so he wants to earn money. We can see this as a positive and that he wants to contribute financially to the family, or we can see it as a negative, someone so young already concerned with money, um, much like his own father. Beneath the Younger, obviously Beneath the is a very unusual name. We see the Ruth Beneath. And that root can be viewed in two ways. That beneath it is viewed as beneath or under others because of the fact that she's black or because she's a woman or because she's poor or because she's young or all of the above. However, it could be viewed in the other way around in the sense that beneath it views others as beneath her because they don't have education or they don't understand the importance of um, cultural heritage and identity. And her nickname, which is Alayo, one for whom bread, no food is not enough, which a saga calls her, is perfect because she's continually wanting more. And think about how she wants to be a doctor, which is very ambitious and respectful profession, especially for the time period, and especially unusual for a poor black female to aspire to that. Um, her hobbies, and again, she wants more, but think about some of them, photography, horseback riding, um, they are associated with privilege. They are also rather expensive. Note that we never get a sense of Beneath having a job in this play. The assumption is that her family is basically paying for her tuition and for her hobbies that she flits to one from another. One could say that's very indicative of her youth, but also one could say that's rather selfish considering that the family is struggling. As Walter says, you know, Travis has had to wear the same pair of shoes for two semesters. And, of course, Benita is able to embrace her cultural identity. Um, she's very resistant to assimilation, but note that she's dating two men at the same time, one who's very much an assimilationist. And, again, one could say that this is evidence of her youth, that she's trying out boyfriends the way she's trying out hobbies. Yet she's very clear that she's not interested in George Murchison, but continues to date him. One assumes because he can provide her with um, a certain level of comfort on their dates because he is rather well-to-do. Notice his last name, Murchison. He's the son of a merchant. Notice his first name, George, very Anglo name, and also the name of the first president of the United States. The idea of the American dream is definitely embedded within this particular play. And her nickname, Benny, I think is also appropriate because Benny is a male name. And of course, she aspires to a male profession, even talks about how she may not marry, which at the time would have raised eyebrows. Um, so again, George Murchison, very much an American name. Um, he believes that the purpose of education is for making money. Always makes me a little sad when he gives that speech. Um, and his assimilationism illustrated in the white shoes that he's wearing, the idea that he's been assimilated to white culture, is very much in contrast with Joseph Asagai, beneath his other boyfriend. Note that he has an Anglo first name, Joseph, but he's got an African last name, Asagai, showing how he's able to merge both of his cultures. He's a mixture of American and African and encourages beneath his cultural identity and believes that part of the purpose of education is to help his people. Um, so he has um, a very unique view about politics in the sense that he himself 
might be removed if he becomes corrupt and he would support that actually now not all of these scenes appear in the film oftentimes scenes are deleted in the film just because of length perhaps the most important scene that's deleted because of length and cost is mrs johnson which we don't see in the film but as we know that watching a film performance is never a substitute for reading the play it's merely a supplement Mrs. Johnson is their nosy neighbor who basically is not very supportive of their moving. I'm actually going to read that passage in a little bit. And her first name is Mrs. Wilhelmina Othella Johnson, her name in its entirety. Wilhelmina should bring forth um, recollections of Will, specifically William Shakespeare, because Othella is the feminized version of Othello a very famous Shakespearean play about racism, where uh, a black man, a Moor, marries a white woman, Desdemona, and the fallout that occurs because of that. A very contemporary play in many respects, considering the time period in which it was written. And I, I always think about one of the most powerful lines in the film when the family is discussing what is the anxiety from the people of Clydebourne Park. Um, why are they so afraid of this family moving in? And the question is raised, what, what are they afraid of, that we're going to eat them? And the response is no, that we're going to marry them. And that's directly related to something like Othello and inter intermarriage and, and interracial marriage and the fear of what that might do to bloodlines. So, Mrs. Wilhelmina Thella Johnson, as we will see very soon, she's very jealous and petty, even racist in her own way, showing some of the obstacles that this family faces. We expect them to face obstacles from people like Mr. Lidner, who is a representative of the Clybourne Park Association. And notice he's the only real Caucasian character that has a, a, a significant role in the play. And he goes by the title of Mr., showing a certain level of respect that we don't see given to the youngers. Notice how often Mr. Ligner calls the youngers you people, for instance. And Bobo, which happens to be Walter's friend, a Bobo is a clown or an idiot. And one might say that Bobo is an idiot by entrusting all of the money to Willie. And Willie is a slang term for phallus or penis. Um, so we could say that he's a real, well, Dick, who steals from the family um, and oftentimes ignored as a character because this character is not human. I would say the plant is one of the most important characters in the play. It serves as a wonderful symbol. Think about how popular mechanics also used the plant or a plant as an idea of a life force that could be destroyed. And that plant is barely kept alive by Mama, much like this family is barely kept alive by Mama. And this plant needs more room to grow, much like this family needs more room to grow. This family is in a cramped apartment. The plant is in a, a cramped pot, if you will. Um, both the family and the, and the plant need to be able to spread their roots. So, And they both need more sunlight. So you can see how important the plan is. And at the ending of the play, the fact that Mama, after she leaves the apartment, she comes back and she takes the plant just to sort of signify the importance of that plant. Even the title, which comes from a Langston Hughes play entitled Harlem, about what happens to a dream deferred. And actually, I wanted to read that poem to you. This is something that you wouldn't see in the production, but you would definitely find in the textual version. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? or crust and sugar over, like a syrupy sweet. Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? And obviously the line of raisin in the sun comes from this, but also thematically this poem is so important because it's about dreams and the entire play is about dreams and the dreams of the characters. In fact, I would relate it to the American dream. Mama wants to own a home um, that's definitely oftentimes associated with the American dream. Walter wants to own his own business and work for himself. 
Benito wants to pursue an education, the uh, also an element of the American dream. Um, the family um, aspires to be financially stable, all of those elements associated with the American dream. The assumption that each generation does better than the previous, which is something that we see hoped for for Travis. And this idea of a raisin in the sun, and think about all of the imagery and the use of um, names as well. A raisin is a, a dried fruit. In effect, it's a it's a grape that basically ha has been dehydrated, but it still has some moisture to it. It's still tasty. It's still alive. Imagine putting that raisin in the sun so that it's depleted of all of its moisture. It basically dries out and dies, much like this family is dying. Think about the color imagery that a raisin is dark um, while the sun, because we're talking about a raisin and the sun is light. And definitely the idea of dark and light and black and Caucasian, that's a definite theme within the play. But also think about how raisin can be slang um, for raising a family. And that's what mom is trying to do is to raise this family. That's what Walter is trying to do. He's trying to raise his son. Um, and the entire family is trying to raise their situation into a better place. Um, and sun. And we can think about sun as sunshine, S-U-N, but we can also think of it as S-O-N. This is all about sons. This is about Walter, who in many instances acts quite childlike. And of course, Walter's own son, Travis, and the raising of sons in particular. So those are just a few things to consider about the play itself. Um, think about the idea of that poem about what happens to a dream deferred, how all of these characters have dreams that are deferred. Uh, if it dries out, it's the loss of all hope or life. Fester like a sore, disease and contagion. Definitely there is this idea of Walter being eaten up alive, in effect. Um, stinking like rotten meat, the idea of decaying. And you know, think about how Walter is willing to basically sacrifice his honor um, in order for money. Syrupy sweet, something that's so sweet that it's unpleasant or fake. Again, I can't help but think of Mrs. Johnson and that neighbor. Um, and I'll read that passage shortly. Is it sagging like a heavy load, overwhelmed with the burden and the tiredness of it all? I think of Ruth, for instance. Or does it explode with anger and violence? And uh, of course, we can't help but think of Walter. At one point, he even says that he's a volcano. Um, Mama's dream is for the home, for the family, the sunlight and garden. Walter's is for wealth um, and also being able to be the family caretaker. Ruth, much like Mama's, is to have a growing home and also some privacy. Imagine the difficulties of having to share a home with your mother-in-law. That leads to some of the tension and that obviously Ruth is the mother, so she gets to decide how she, to raise Travis, but they are residing in Mama's home and her home, her rules. Benita, of course, is about education and career and identity. Travis, even his dream of carrying groceries and being a little bit more financially stable. And one of the things I like about Hansberry is that she's so deliberate as an author that even her stage directions are literary. And of course, if we were watching the play, we would never see the stage directions or we would never read or be exposed to the stage directions. But I just wanted to very briefly read to you the opening stage direction where the younger's living room would be a comfortable and well-ordered room if it were not for a number of indestructible contradictions to the state of being. Might I argue the entire play is about indestructible contradictions. Its furnishings are typical and undistinguished. Their primary features are that they've had to accommodate the living of too many people for too many years, and they are tired. I love the personification of the furniture, that the Furniture represents the family, in effect. And when we continue on with the play itself, we see, as I had talked about, that episode with scrambled eggs and also Walter's blatant racism, where he basically tells Benita, um, in my version, this is on page 38, you know, why, why can't you be like a nurse like other women or, you know, just shut up? Um, 
one piece it's very short but I, I think it illustrates the dire situation of the family is again for me on page 58 and it's about rats and it's something that we don't see in the film version but i think it illustrates just how horrible their environment is at, at this point the family is talking with one another and then there's a, a sudden commotion from the street and beneath the ghost of the window to look out and says, what on earth is going out, going on out there? These kids. And she throws open the window and shouts to the children from the street, sticking her head out of the window and saying, Travis, Travis, what are you doing down there? And then she sees, oh, Lord, they're chasing a rat. And, of course, Mama's quite upset and says angrily, tell that youngin to get himself up here at once. And beneath it says, Travis, you come upstairs at once. And Ruth is horrified, her face twisted, saying, chasing a rat. And Travis comes upstairs full of excitement and narrative, going to his mother and saying, Mama, you should have seen the rat, big as a cat, honest. And then he shows an exaggerated size with his hands. Golly, the rat was really cutting and Bubber caught him with his heel and the janitor, Mr. Bartnett, got him with a stick. And then they got him in a corner and bam, bam, bam. He was still jumping around and bleeding like everything too. And there's rat blood all over the street. And of course, everyone is horrified. And Mama says, you shut up now, talking about all that terrible stuff. And Travis is, is completely bewildered. He doesn't understand. As we see in the stage directions, Travis is staring at his mother with a stunned expression. And then Benita comes up quickly, takes him away from his grandmother, ushers him to the door and says, you go back outside and play, but not with any rats. Um, so again, just to show how dire things are for this, for this family. The meaning of money, which again for me is on page 74, where Walter is talking to Mama and saying that, you know, money's life. And Mama says, uh, something's changed. You something new, boy. In my time, we was worried about not being lynched. Getting to the north if we could. How to stay alive and still have a pinch of dignity. Now, here come you and Benita talking about things we ain't never even thought about. Hardly me and your daddy. You ain't satisfied or proud of nothing we done. I mean that you had a home. That we kept you out of trouble till you were grown. That you don't have to ride on the ride to work on the back of nobody's streetcar. You my children. But how different we've become. And as, as I had referenced earlier, Walter makes a point of pointing out George Murchison's white shoes, which serve as a symbol that George Murchison has assimilated into white culture. And he talks about, that's George Murchison, from his perspective, what the purpose of school is. And what he says is that you, you go to read books, to learn facts, to get grades, to pass the course, to get a degree. That's all. It has nothing to do with thoughts. And his viewpoint is very different from Asa guys, as we shall soon see. But I wanted to talk about the section with Mrs. Johnson, again, oftentimes deleted from film productions um, in order to shorten the length and also to save some costs with not ha having to hire an actor, understudy, wardrobe, things of that nature. And basically, at this point, Mrs. Johnson, who is a neighbor, and she knocks and they let her in. And the family isn't too happy that she's visiting. We see this in the stage directions. Um, Mama is silent as someone knocks on the door. Mama and Ruth exchange weary and knowing glances. Ruth opens it to admit the neighbor, Mrs. Johnson, who's a rather squeaky, wide-eyed lady of no particular age with a newspaper under her arm. And Mama changes her expression to acute delight and a ringing, cheerful greeting, saying, saying, oh, hello there, Mrs. Johnson, and Johnson, and in the stage directions, we're told, this is a woman who's decided long ago to be enthusiastic about everything. She's inclined to wave her wrist vigorously. Hello there yourself. How are you this evening, Ruth? And Ruth, not being much of a deceptive type, and of course, you need to have a good actor to be able to give that sense. Fine, Miss Johnson, how are you? And then Johnson reaches out quickly, playfully, and pats Ruth's stomach and says, ain't you starting to poke out none yet? And she mugs with delight at the over-familiar remark. Her eyes dart around looking at the crates and packing preparation. Mama's face is a cold sheet of endurance. Oh, ain't we getting ready around here, though? Yes, sir, look at there. I'm telling you, the youngers is really getting ready to move on up a little higher, bless God. 
And Mama says a little dryly, doubting the sincerity of the blesser. Bless God. And Johnson says, he's good, ain't he? Mama says, oh, yes, he's good. Johnson says, I mean, sometimes he works in mysterious ways, but he works, don't he? And Mama says, yes, he does. And Johnson says, I'm so happy for y'all. This here child looks like she could just about pop open with happiness, don't she? And where's all the rest of the family? And Mama says, Benny's gone to bed. And Johnson says, ain't no. And in the stage directions, the implication is pregnancy. Sickness done hit you, I hope. Mama says, no, she's just tired. She was out this evening. Johnson, all in a coup. Oh, ain't that lovely. She's still going out with that little Murchison boy. And Mama dryly says, mm-hmm. And Johnson says, that's lovely. You sure got lovely children, younger. Me and Isaiah talk all the time about what fine children you bless with. We sure do. And then Mama says, Ruth, give Miss Johnson a piece of sweet potato pie and some milk. And Johnson says, oh, honey, I can hardly stay a minute. And let's drop in to see if there's anything I could do. But she accepts the food easily. I says, I guess you all see the news. What's well, all over the color paper this week? Mama says, no, didn't get mine this week. And Johnson lifts her head and blinking with the spirit of catastrophe. You mean you ain't read about them colored people that was bombed out their place out there? Ruth straightens with concern, takes the paper and reads it. Johnson notices and feeds her commentary, saying, Ain't it something how bad these here white folks is getting in Chicago? Lord, getting so you might think you were down in Mississippi. And then with a tremendous and rather insincere sense of melodrama. Again, you have to have a good actor to do this. Of course, I think it's wonderful how our folks keep on pushing out. You hear some of these Negroes around here talking about how they don't go where they want it and all that, but not me, honey. Wilhelmina Othella Johnson goes anywhere, anytime she feels like it. And the stage direction is, this is a lie. And she says, yes, I do. Well, if we left it up here to these crackers, the poor ends, and she actually says the word, would have nothing. And then she claps her hand over her mouth and says, oh, I always forget you don't allow that word in your house. And Mama, quietly looking at her, says, no, I don't allow it. And Johnson vigorously says, me neither. I was just telling Isaiah yesterday when he come using it in front of me, I said, Isaiah, it's just like Miss Young say all the time. And Mama says, do you want some more pie? And Johnson says, no, no, thank you. This was lovely. Got to get on over home and have my midnight coffee. I hear some people say I don't let them sleep, but I find I can't close my eyes right less than I don't add my last cup of coffee. And she waits a beat, undaunted, is what the stage directions say. My good night coffee, I calls it. And Mama, and the stage direction is with much eye rolling and communication between herself and Ruth. Ruth, why don't you give Miss Johnson some coffee? And Ruth gives Mama an unpleasant look for her kindness. Johnson, accepting the coffee, asks, where's brother? And Mama says, he's lying down. And Johnson says, hmm, sure gets his beauty rest, don't he? Good looking man. Sure is a good looking man. And then she pats Ruth's stomach again and says, guess that's how come we keep on having babies around here. And then she winks at Mama. One thing about brother, he always knew how to have a good time. And so ambitious. But it was his idea, y'all moving out. Clybourne Park, Lord, I bet this time next month, y'all name will be in the paper plenty. And she holds her hands to mark off each word of the headline she can see in front of her. Negroes invade Cly Clybourne Park bombed. And Mama, who looks at Ruth, says, we ain't exactly moving out there to get bombed. And Johnson says, oh, honey, you know, I'm praying to God every day that don't nothing like that happen. But you have to think of life like it is. And these here Chicago pecker words are some bad pecker words. And Mama wearily and also in amazement, it says, we done thought about all that, Miss Johnson. And then Benita comes out in a robe, goes to the bathroom. Johnson says, hello there, Benny. And Benita crisply says, hello, Miss Johnson. And Johnson asks, how's school? And Benita says crisply, fine, thank you. And then she leaves. Johnson, who's insulted, says, getting so she don't have much to say to nobody. And Mama said the child was on her way to the bathroom. And Johnson says, I know. Sometimes she act like she ain't got the time to pass the day when nobody ain't been to college. Well, I ain't criticizing her none. It's just, well, you know how some of our young people get when they get a little education. Mama and Ruth say nothing. They just look at her. And she says, yes, well, I guess I better get on home. The state direction says she's unmoving. Of course, I can understand how she must be proud and everything, being the only one in the family to make something of herself. 
I know just being a chauffeur ain't never satisfied, brother, none. You shouldn't feel like that, though. Nothing wrong with being a chauffeur. And Mama says, there's plenty wrong with it. And Johnson says, what? And Mama says, plenty. My husband always said being any kind of a servant wasn't a fifth thing for a man to have to be. He always said a man's hands were made to make things or turn the earth with, not to drive nobody's car for him or carry their slop jars. My boy's just like him. He wasn't meant to wait on nobody. And Johnson, rising somewhat offended, says, hmm, youngers is too much for me. And she looks around. You sure one proud acting bunch of color folks? Well, I always think like Booker T. Washington said that time. Education has spoiled many a plow hat. And Mama asks, is that what Booker T. said? And Johnson says, he sure did. And Mama says, well, sounds just like him, the fool. And Johnson indignantly says, well, he was one of our great men. And Mama said, who said so? And Johnson nonplus says, you know, me and you, we never agreed about some things, Lena Younger. I guess I better be going. And Ruth quickly says, good night. And Johnson says, good night. Oh, and she thrusts it at her. You can keep this paper. And then with a trill, night. And Ruth says, if ignorance was gold. And Mama says, shh, don't talk about folks behind their backs. Ruth says, but you do. Mama says, I'm old and corrupted. And then Benita enters and Mama says, you was rude to Miss Johnson, Benita. I don't like it at all. And Benita, who says, and this is one of the more important lines in the play, Mama, if there are two things we as a people have got to overcome, one is the Ku Klux Klan, the other is Mrs. Johnson. And that's on page 104 in my version. And again, you would expect the Lindners of the world to serve as obstacles, but it's obvious that Mrs. Johnson is not hoping the best for this family. Um, so their own community serves as a kind of barrier. Walter talks about his dreams on page 108 and 109, which include things like having Travis be able to choose from the great catalogs of the colleges of the world. And that's something that's admirable, that he wants to provide education for his family. At one point, when Lindner comes and tries to convince the family to basically be bought out, Benita makes a comment, 30 pieces, and that's a biblical reference to the amount of money that was paid to Judas to betray Jesus. Just wanted you to know that. And again, the line that I was talking about that's very important that the family's talking about, what does everyone in Clydeborn Park fear? That we're going to eat them? And of course, the response is no, that we're going to marry them. Um, Mama talks about on page 121, the plant expressing her. Um, and you can see lots of parallels between Mama and the plant and the plant and the family. A saw guy's dreams, page 135 to 136, his dreams are so different than George Murchison's because he talks about some of his goals. Um, he says, isn't there something wrong in a house, in a world where all the dreams, good or bad, must depend on the death of a man? I never thought to see you like this, Lyle, you. Your brother made a mistake and you are grateful to him so that now you can give up on the ailing human race. And he says, in my village at home, it's the exceptional man who can even read a newspaper or ever sees a book at all. We'll go home. Much of what I will have to say will seem strange to the people in my village, but I will teach and work and things will happen slowly and swiftly. At times it will seem that nothing changes at all. And then again, sudden dramatic events which make history leap into the future. Then quiet again, retrogression even. Guns, murder, revolution. And I even will have moments when I wonder if the quiet was not better than all the death and hatred. But I will look about my village at the illiteracy, disease, ignorance, and I won't wonder long. Perhaps I'll be a great man. I mean, perhaps I'll be able to hold on to the substance of truth and find my way always with the right course. Perhaps forward I will be butchered in my bed some night by the servants of my empire or perhaps i shall live to be a very old man respected and esteemed in my new nation perhaps i shall hold office and this is what i'm trying to tell you elio perhaps the things i believe now for my country will be wrong and outmoded and i will not understand and do terrible things to have things my way or merely to keep my power don't you see there'll be young men and women not british soldiers but my own black countrymen to step out of the shadow some evening and slit my then useless throat? Don't you see they've always been there, that they always will be, and that such a thing as my own death will be in advance? 
they who might kill me even actually replenish all that I was. Such a contrast to George Merchant's view of life. And one of my favorite lines in the play, of course, uh, uh, this is when Walter has lost all of the money and is willing to um, basically sacrifice his pride by selling out to Lindner. And uh, Benita says that there's nothing left to love of her brother. And on page 145, Mama says, when do you think is the time to love somebody? When they've done good and made everybody happy? No, that's not the time at all. It's when they're at their lowest. And I, I think that's a wonderful piece of advice. Another wonderful piece of advice is when Asaga and Benita are talking. And Benita says she wants to sit around and think. Sit a while and think. And Asaga tells her to do that. And I always say that as well. That that's a very useful thing to do. To sit a while and think. And of course, Walter is willing to sacrifice his pride. But once he is confronted with Lidner at the end... With Walter's own son watching, he changes his mind and he talks about the pride of the family and that his sister is going to be a doctor. And think about his transformation from the beginning of the play. And they, they aren't going to accept his money. And, of course, one of the central questions of the play is, should mom have given the money? And the easy answer is no, because he's irresponsible and he's a drunkard. Or yes, because ultimately he needed to be trusted enough so that he could fail spectacularly and learn a lesson. Because without that, would he have ever gotten to the point where we, he would have that transformation at the ending of the play? And of course, we don't know what's going to happen to this family after they leave. I mean, definitely it's hopeful in the sense that they have their new home. Um, and the money that Walter has lost was not necessary for the down payment of the home. The assumption was that part of it would go to Beneath and her schooling, and the other part of it would go for Walter ch to use in whatever way he wanted. So it's not going to necessarily impact their living situation, um, at least financially. As we know, they're not wanted in this neighborhood. And I, I suppose from a practical standpoint, you should say that the family should have accepted Littner's offer to be bought out and make a profit. And one could say if they were clever enough, they could continue to buy property in Clybourne Park, continue to be bought out until ultimately the younger family owns Clybourne Park. But again, one of the central questions of the drama is how do you put a price on pride and honor? And perhaps that's something that's priceless. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the major elements in A Raisin in the Sun, where we are now is transitioning into our poetry unit. Good news, poetry is shorter than drama, um, but poetry is very dense and compact, so you are going to have to do multiple readings. We'll begin the poetry unit just like we've begun every other unit, where you have some introductory information about what poetry is and how to read it and write about it, which I'll talk about next class. And unfortunately, I'm not able to find those pieces online for free, but I am able to find the actual poems that we are reading online for free. And I will provide all of those links to you. Occasionally, you will see some poems. And after the poem, instead of a page number, you will see handout. And that is, if we were meeting in person, I would provide you with the handout. Obviously, we're not meeting in person, so I'll provide you with the link. Those are poems that are no longer included in the edition that we happen to be using. And we'll be doing poetry right up until the ending of the semester. So there won't be time for us to write another paper about poetry. But our very last class is the final examination. And the bulk of the final, 80%, will be devoted to poetry. So the best way to uh, prepare for the final is to read all the poems and to watch all of the videos and participate in all the class discussion forums about poetry. Because it will be an open book, open note finals. And I'll give you a series of essay questions and you can choose within there. Um, normally, if you were taking this in a face-to-face -face situation, you'd have two hours. Since you're taking it in an online situation, I'll give you 24 hours. But you really shouldn't be spending more than two hours or so on the exam. So I know that it won't be as neat or polished or developed as a paper, nor should it be. But you still should be able to articulate what a poem is and how a poem functions with an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. 
So that's 80 points of the final. That leaves 20 points, 10 points for short story and 10 points for drama. Again, I'll give you a series of shorter essay questions and you get to choose within that. And it's open book, open notes. And the best way to prepare for those sections is obviously to have done all of the reading and watched all of the videos because you don't know what will be asked in the final exam. And again, open book, open notes. It's not a test in memorization. But we'll talk a little bit more about the final as the semester progresses. Where I wanted to end up with was our discussion forum question, which will be due on Friday the 19th. As you know, you're not required to respond to your peers, but you are required to read their responses. And my responses in turn, which will be coming in the next week or so as I catch up. And the question is about our upcoming paper. What do you think you will write paper number two about and why? So again, you're not committed necessarily just because you've written something in the discussion form, but this is a time for you to begin thinking about, if not actually begin writing paper number two. So next class, we will continue on with poetry. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And I'll see you next class. Take care. Bye-bye.